say so. No, I don't like them. You talk to me about a hundred syllables, and it's obvious that a hundred syllables aren't enough when you take twenty-five to say the sun is setting. And then you don't say the Lord's Prayer at a deathbed. You'll say I put it in my scenario, but you know that I only intend these scenarios as a guide to you. And then the seven-syllabled lines, for the love of God, don't end lines with K, Q and encore. Now then, can't you do better, retaining as far as possible the words I sent you, but turning them into better rhymes? Giuseppe Verdi's ferocious letter to his librettist Francesco Maria Piave was written as they were working on a revision of his opera La Forza del Destino, two years after it had had its world premiere at the Imperial Opera in St. Petersburg. To have been commissioned to write a new opera for the exalted Mariinsky Theatre was the highest honour for an Italian composer. And by now, the musician who'd been turned down by the Milan Conservatory 30 years earlier was enjoying international fame and wealth on a rare scale for an artist. At home, Verdi was a national hero, and the previous year he'd been elected a Member of Parliament for the Turin area in the now almost unified Italy. He didn't need to compose any more, as he could easily have retired on his very substantial savings. But he was just 49 years old, and his creative imagination was growing all the time. And so now he enjoyed the luxury of writing only what he wanted to take on. In fact, though, he couldn't have been less retired. He was to go on composing operas for another 30 years, and in his old age he was to stun the world with his astonishing masterpieces Otello and Falstaff which revolutionised Italian opera forever. At his death, a hundred years ago, he left a legacy of 28 operas, a requiem mass, four sacred pieces, a string quartet, and a few songs and instrumental works. He bequeathed operas that miraculously brought new dimensions to famous plays, such as Macbeth and Othello by Shakespeare, and La Traviata, based on La Damo Comelia by Dumas. And he immortalised theatrical works that might otherwise have been all but forgotten if they hadn't become the basis of his operas, such as La Forza del Destino, Un Ballo in Mascara, and Nabucco. Verdi was deeply engrossed in the world of literature, and from the beginning to the end of his career, he slaved to find a new kind of musical expression that would deeply and truthfully reflect the sounds and expressiveness of the words that the various characters speak. To achieve that, he was as fearsomely demanding of his librettists as he was of everyone else. He refused to work with the librettos that fell short of his dramatic standards, and as the years went by, he took an ever greater hand in their creation. The Bear of Busetto, as he was called, would never compromise on any artistic standards, and for him, his vital starting point was a libretto that strongly told the story he wanted to evoke in music. In fact, it was a segment of the Bible that drove Verdi to start composing again after he'd most firmly decided to give up forever after the dreadful traumas of the years 1838 to 1840. Only in his late twenties he'd had to suffer the deaths of his two children and then his wife, and on top of all that his second opera, Un Giorno di Regno, had been a catastrophic failure. And so when Bartolomeo Morelli, the impresario of La Scala, tried to persuade him to compose an opera about the biblical story of Nebuchadnezzar, even though the libretto had already been written by the famous and highly revered poet, scholar and novelist, Temistocles Solera, Verdi felt so destroyed that he couldn't conceive that he would ever compose again. But then a now famous chance turn of fate changed all that. Verdi had persuaded Verdi to take Solera's libretto home with him, and the composer later recounted what happened. I got home and with an almost violent gesture threw the manuscript on the table, standing upright in front of it. The book had opened in falling on the table. Without knowing how, I gazed at the page that lay before me and read this line, Va pensiero sul ali dorate. I ran through the verses that followed and was much moved, all the more because they were almost a paraphrase from the Bible, the reading of which has always delighted me. It was still some time before Verdi felt able to start writing his opera Nabucco, but the seed of inspiration had begun to grow. He was greatly moved by the subject of the exiled Jews' courageous battle to regain their homeland, and Solera's poetic and dramatic writing made a strong impression on him. 
And so, in due course, in 1841, the opera was written, and the following year it was premiered with enormous success. Va Pensiero, as the Hebrew slaves nostalgically longed for their lost homeland, powerfully stirred the hearts of the Italians, who themselves longed for national unification and identity, and the end of living under Austrian rule, their Risorgimento.
Va Pensiero, the chorus of the Hebrew slaves from Nabucco, and virtually the unofficial national anthem of Italy for the last 150 or so years. It was performed there by the chorus and orchestra of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden, conducted by Bernard Heitink. And it was his tremendous determination not to be beaten that changed the course of Italian opera forever. Only shortly after the Stefanio debacle, he ran into more trouble over the next opera that was presented to the censors. For this new work, which was originally called La Maledizione, The Curse, he was collaborating with the outstandingly talented and imaginative poet Francesco Maria Piave, who was very much in sympathy with his new outlook. He provided him with his libretti for Ernani, Macbeth, and also Stefelio. In November 1850, Verdi and Piave submitted their new work to the censors for what they thought would surely be easy approval this time. They were wildly wrong, and ultimately so were the censors who tried to prevent the launch of what was to be the most important landmark yet in Italian opera. Right from that terrifying prelude, Verdi's Rigoletto stunned the audience in Venice on the 11th of March, 1851. There was a new subtlety in the characterization and an intensely gripping power throughout the work that marked the beginning of a new era of dramatic realism in Italian opera.
Although Jerusalem failed, it wasn't a case of it being a poor opera. It was acknowledged another masterpiece of the Paris Opera in 1857. One contributing factor was the hatred of everything French throughout Italy in the years that followed France's suppression of the Roman Republic in 1849. When the Crusaders enter, Roger recognizes his brother and asks permission to join the Crusade. Now, unusually, this chorus, sung by the soldiers and pilgrims, is led by three bases in unison, the Count, the Papal Legate, and Roger. Verdi had first been invited to compose for France in 1845, soon after the prima of Giovanna d'Arco. Now, in 1847, he had the opportunity to experiment with grand opera without the risk of presenting a totally new work. Jerusalem is simply too big. Some scenes require a stage area of which few theatres could boast in the 1880s. In the finale, the wounded Roger confesses his crime and begs forgiveness from his brother, Le Comte. His last request is that the tent be opened to allow him to see the city of Jerusalem.
part of the finale of Jerusalem, Roger was sung by Roberto Scanduzzi. <laughs> 